why have all cranberries you buy been bounced seven times? Who treats map changes like hot news bulletins? What makes the pendulums rebound when they don't even touch? How do these toys further a child's education in art? Industry on Parade, a brand new look at our America, produced on film each week by the National Association of Manufacturers. The Cranberry Bogs of Massachusetts, source of 60% of all the cranberries raised in America. And outside America, the cranberry is virtually unknown. In Washington and Oregon, they pick cranberries with vacuum cleaners. In Wisconsin, by flooding the bogs. Neither method is satisfactory here on Cape Cod, so the traditional scoop is still used. An experienced picker can send in as many as 100 pounds an hour to the National Cranberry Association plant in Hanson, Massachusetts. Much of the harvest is frozen to be processed into cranberry sauce later thus helping to eliminate the strictly seasonal aspect of the plant's operations, spreading employment out over a much longer period. But let's see what happens to the cranberries that are processed immediately. The berries still have sticks and bits of leaves that were scooped up with them. These are removed by blowers. The debris is caught in a grate and the berries drop through. How do you think they test a berry for soundness? They bounce it. Every berry gets seven chances to bounce over a four-inch wall. If it doesn't make it in seven tries, it ends up on the waste pile. The same with those small enough to drop through the grading grills, or those that are spotted or otherwise imperfect. After a thorough washing, the berries move in bucket lifts to a large bin, from which they will be weighed out in batches. When the cook is ready for a batch, he just presses a button and the berries swirl to the cooking room and into the kettle through a Pyrex tube. When cranberries were sold only in the unprocessed state, most people ate them only at Thanksgiving and Christmas. It was the founder of this organization who back in 1912 originated the idea of canning cranberry sauce and made it possible for us to enjoy the berry the year round. After being washed and sterilized, the cans are filled and capped at the rate of one million cans every three hours. To cool, the hot cans go through a roto cooler that drops their temperature 100 degrees in five minutes. Labeling. An electric eye makes sure the label is on straight and glued firmly. Then on to be boxed. They put up cranberries in a lot of ways now. Cranberry juice cocktail dietetic cranberries, and specialty products of all kinds. But by far the most popular use still is cranberry sauce, whole or jelly. So firmly fixed is the cranberry in the national diet that it's actually even more American than those other favorites, ice cream and apple pie. More than one half of America's 62 million working men and women are now employed in business and industries that didn't even exist 50 years ago. These new frontiers of work and achievement have been opened up largely in industries such as chemicals, electronics, automotive, and atomic energy, all resulting from our unmatched research programs and our genius at invention, all possible only under our individual enterprise system. Our nation's constantly expanding industrial and business horizons offer high hope for youth of our country. America is still the land of opportunity. A people on the go as we are depend heavily on maps for traveling or the study of geography. We start using maps early and continue throughout our lives. But none of us is more dependent on maps or charts as they're called at sea and in the air than airplane pilots 
especially on big commercial airliners that can span a continent in a few hours. They even carry maps that show every last detail of airports everywhere. Such maps come from here, Jefferson and Company of Denver. Let anybody build a new hangar, lengthen a runway, change a radio frequency, or otherwise alter the pattern by which men fly, and the news is flashed to this office, where immediately a new page is prepared for the airway manual to be in the hands of pilots within a week. From the drafting department, corrected charts go to the editors, who check and verify all details with the officially approved information. Then, they're ready for photo engraving. The picture that's taken of the chart must be perfect so every line and letter will be sharp and clear for easy reading in the cockpit of a moving plane. The negative is carefully retouched to bring out detail. When he finishes, the metal plate is prepared from which the charts will be printed. First, the metal is coated with an etching emulsion that will react to light much like film. Zinc plate and negative picture are held in contact, and when exposed to light, every little line in the picture will be etched into the metal. The plate then will be ready for printing the charts. Though individual pages of the airway manual are only five and a half by eight and a half inches, many are printed on a single large sheet. The manual was started nearly 30 years ago by Captain E.B. Jefferson, at that time a barnstorming pilot who jotted down air routes, flight data, and other information in a dime notebook. Other pilots demanded copies of the notebook, and thus a business was born. Now it includes not only the manual, but many maps of other kinds as well. This is the only type, though, that demands the speed of a newspaper in keeping up with the facts. Pages for the loose leaf manual are collated, that is, lined up in order, page one, page two, page three, and so on. One of the newer specialties is a map not for airplane pilots, but for airplane passengers, a colored topographical map that helps them identify the terrain they're flying over. Topographical maps inject a third dimension. They must show not only the relative positions of points indicated, but also comparative heights. Skilled cartographers working here have developed techniques for giving maps new realism. They compare their work with the contour transparency turned out by the U.S. Coast and Geodetic Survey, final authority in the map-making field. No longer are states just flat areas of yellow, green, and pink. Now they're living land masses in their natural color, portraits, as it were, of the Earth's surface, showing far more than mere distances between towns. Newest thing in toys, magnet-powered telephones. In the kitchen, magnets to hold knives, pot holders, and messages. In the living room, toy trains with magnetic wheels to hold them on the tracks going up grades. In the bedroom, well, not so new, is the electric blanket with its automatic temperature controls, also made possible by the magnet. There are many household standbys that employ magnets, like the thermostat that regulates room temperatures or the regular telephone and the radio. But here's another fairly new one, a catch-all that will hold paper clips, bobby pins, anything made of ferrous metal. Indiana Steel Products Company of Valparaiso, Indiana, is one of the magnet producers who find the market for their output mushrooming at an amazing rate. A permanent magnet is an alloy including metals like aluminum, nickel, cobalt, and iron. The magnets come out of the mold in clusters. Other magnets are made by a method called powder metallurgy, whereby the various metals in powder form are packed together under tremendous pressure, then fused in an oven into a light porous hole. Magnets come in all shapes and sizes, and if their uses in the home have increased, that's nothing compared to the way they're finding new applications in industry. Before being shipped, they have to be demagnetized. 
Otherwise, they'd cause no end of trouble en route, picking up stray metal all along the way. Anyhow, the manufacturer who receives them will want to re-magnetize them to just the right strength, get them to exactly the right magnetism to separate coins from slugs in a vending machine, for example, or subway turnstile. A slug contains too much iron. The magnet pulls it over to the reject slot. Amazing things, magnets. They bounce off each other without even touching. Who's got a new application for this characteristic of the magnet? Industry has. It comes up with dozens of them every year. The steady decline in the accident frequency rate in the manufacturing industry makes employees safer on the job than off the job. This consistent downward trend over the years is a result of industry's increasingly effective accident prevention work in providing safe, healthful working conditions, safe tools, safe machines, and safe work methods. Industry urges employers to continue and intensify their safety work in accord with sound and progressive safety practices. Manhattan's Museum of Modern Art, home of advanced paintings, sculptures, and other art objects. And what are the art objects on display here? The products of industry, or that part of industry that supplies furnishings for the home. The museum, together with Chicago's Merchandise Mart, puts on an annual showing of the best examples of modern design in home furnishings. Design that affects eye appeal, function, construction, and price, too. The committee that selects products for display in the exhibit finds true artistry in such familiar items as bottles, bowls, trays, dishes, fabrics, lamps, even washing machines. It's no longer enough that a product be merely useful. Now even a soup ladle has to have style. Another current display at the museum injects the same call for artistic advancement into the field of children's toys. The showing puts the emphasis on premium toys, the inexpensive sort that manufacturers send to children who mail in box tops. Davis Delaney, the commercial printers, and industrial designers A.F. Arnold and Joseph Zalewski agreed that such giveaways had to be low in cost. But, they asked, what's to prevent them from being educational at the same time? And how are these educational? Well, believe it or not, they're artistically sound. Their colors and lines are said to develop a child's artistic taste and expression. Animated figures may replace whistles and police badges in the giveaway field. And if they develop as much art appreciation as they do enthusiasm, who can object? Certainly this little girl doesn't, and neither does mother, who's all in favor of fostering a love of art, especially when it comes the easy way. Thank you. 